we are actually at the beginning of a new era for our species where we have the physical aspect of it. We have the history that we built. We have the genetic legacy that we've captured from all life for the last you know, two plus billion years. And then we are now creating this new intelligent species that is able to look far and beyond and have a higher potential for seeing into the future and for traveling to places we haven't gone. And if we can see our place in terms of melding these together and see it as a privilege for us to be here, I think it changes our perspective of the fear that so many people have. Welcome to the next Insights Podcast, Intersecting Science, Technology, and Consciousness. I'm your host, Michael Morrissey, Strategic Futurist and founder of Next Collabs. This podcast explores the transformative potential of generative AI and its many applications for personal, professional, and business growth. Join us where we celebrate the next insights, those aha moments that shift your point of view and open the door into the next paradigm. You'll hear the latest ideas and thought-provoking conversations with industry experts, authors, thought leaders, equipping you with the strategies to harness the relentless pace of change in the AI era. Whether you're a CEO, leader, or interested in personal growth, This podcast will give you the insights to leverage AI, to amplify human potential, and consciously shape the future for humanity first. Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Next Insights Podcast. Today, I'm excited to have author and thought leader Alvin Graylin on the show. His position as China president at HTC from 2016 to 2023 was well known to our community having spent much of the pandemic in the metaverse, and in particular, the platform Engage VR, and Alvin's influence clearly could be felt there with the HTC Vive event stage, which Alvin was our landing pad almost every week in Bookflow, our thought leadership community. And by the way, as an architect and designer, I have to say it was a beautifully designed kind of event stage. I'm glad you made use of that. And I don't know exactly where the fit is between HTC and Engage. I felt like they were intertwined. So we actually invested in Engage right around the pandemic because I I really saw the value what they were providing. And they were also part of our XR suite, which I don't know if you knew about, but we essentially put together a few different apps that we thought could help to increase collaboration and increase communication during a time when people were physically separated. So we were trying to use the technology to do good in that way. So that's exciting. I mean, literally, we were on the receiving end of that heart centered vision that you had there because I felt it. So thank you. And so today we're going to talk about your new book, co authored with Louis Rosenberg Our Next Reality How the AI Powered Metaverse Will Reshape the World. And it does a beautiful job of presenting what I call kind of beyond the opposites, kind of like a balanced overview of our next reality at the intersection of AI and XR. And by the way, this podcast is a prequel because we're going to be hosting Alvin on April the 3rd at our Thought Leadership Community Bookflow. Really excited for two episodes, and I'm hoping I can get Lewis in on the 2nd, on the 10th of April, to kind of amplify the two kind of positions that I think are very necessary to navigate the future, especially, I think it first got surfaced when the AI moment occurred and we go, oh my God, the opportunities are huge, but the existential risk is real. You can't ignore it. So then within our own community, Alvin, we call this optimistic dystopianism. And so all of us actually kind of took this on, like we're going to hold the opposites. And in a way, I think you are a kind of a beautiful representative based on your backstory between China and the US, between all these different exponential technologies from AI VR, XR, AR, MR, the whole continuum, that you're in a beautiful position to kind of tell us the bigger story and hold the tension and help us steer the future consciously. So really excited to have you on the show. No, well, thank you for uh, inviting me, Michael. And I, I look forward to this chat. And I, I appreciate that you've put a lot of time into reading the book and preparing the, the discussion. So this should be, should be fun. As I, I sent uh, you an email prior to this of, of just something that came up in my mind at the default mode network works really well in the middle of the night. So at four in the morning, I thought, oh, there's three books that I think form a trilogy here. And the crazy thing is that it's happened like 2022, 2023, 2024. And that is Matt Ball's The Metaverse, 
which I think was like the spirit of the age in 2022. If you looked at October, not November, but October, <laughs> you thought this is where it's at. And we did like five weeks on that book and Matt's work in the metaverse. And then 2023, you know, post November 2022, the AI moment, I think Mustafa Suleiman's book, The Coming Wave, kind of captured the spirit of what we call the year of AI. He does a really good job of surfacing what is the meaning of this moment. And then what I find really beautiful and fascinating, only a couple of weeks ago, your book just came out. And by the way, we have our finger on the pulse. Literally, we are right there, going to meet you right where you're at. AI plus the metaverse, an AI-powered metaverse. To me, that seems like a great kind of one plus one equals this next moment. So tell us a little bit about you know your book and this kind of almost this transition that's happened only in three years to something more comprehensive like an AI-powered metaverse. Well, this actually goes back to 30-something years ago. I studied both AI and XR and semiconductors in the early 90s. And add projects and research in, in all of these areas. And it's amazing to see these technologies all maturing simultaneously in the last few years. And, you know, in the middle, we've seen multiple waves of ups and downs of, of AI and XR. I think semiconductors just continue to, to grow in importance, but in different use cases. Now, I think what we're seeing now is that they are to a point where they will have dramatic and long lasting and in our society. And that's what kind of drove me to write this book about two years ago. I really saw that the pace of change is increasing and it will be also changing at a pace that society will not be able to adapt to. So I wanted to write a book to bring that out to the forefront so that people in positions of influence, whether policymakers or corporate leaders, would be able to better understand what's coming and take the actions needed so that we can avoid the potential downsides that it will create. Because I think if we can avoid those negative ramifications, then we could have an amazing, very long-term positive future that can be created and enabled by these technologies. That's the crux of what drove me to do it. And the fact that we had the pandemic actually gave me the time to do it because I used to travel a lot. And you know, during the pandemic for probably about a year, I traveled a lot less than I used to which allowed me to really hunker down and really put this stuff onto paper. And Lewis is, is an amazing partner in writing this book because even though I think we are both optimists inside, we express our optimism in different ways. And the fact that we hold different views on things actually allowed us to create a balanced book that gave different possibilities and showed them in a way that came kind of true from our heart. And I think for people who read the book, they will know what I'm talking about. And I think for somebody to really understand something, you really have to have seen both sides of the story so that you can come to your own conclusion. Because I think Socrates said, I can't teach anybody anything. I can only make you think. So if we can make people think, then they will then come to a conclusion that they will believe in and they will take action on. And I think that's what's really needed today is that the right actions need to be taken so that we don't have to go through the potential downsides to get the benefit of the upside. And also, I think from a political, geopolitical perspective, I've been, you know, living in China for the last 18 years, you know, starting three different venture-backed startups there and then working for HTC the last eight years. So, you know, I have the kind of China perspective, but, you know, also I'm an American citizen. I, I, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was nine. And so I have both country and at heart in terms of wanting good things to happen. And I work for a Taiwanese company, which right now is a very sensitive place in the world. So I am trying to express things in a balanced way. So I'm not taking any particular bias in terms of national or political bias. Because I think what I hear a lot right now is that there is a tendency to want to, to create conflict, to want to create and us and them, and it's you know a race condition where if we don't do it, they will, and if they get there first, we're going to be behind. And I think that's the wrong perspective. And uh, we can talk a little bit more over the next hour about how do we avoid that and what is the downside of having that type of a race condition, which I think it completely the the opposite of what we need to do as a species to to really get our society to the right place. Well, I mean, in so many ways, like towards the back of the book, you surface Maslow's pyramid of needs. And if you've read Scott Barry Kaufman's Transcend, I know you're a voracious reader. And it sounds like when you're on a lot of these flights, like I, I love a flight because you can't move. So you, all you can do is read. So that's probably how you power through 100 books a year. 
the flights, uh, they do not only allow you to consume more content, but it allows you to have the focus to actually digest it and then really bring that content into your own mind and try to figure out what it means and find connections between content. Because when we're in the office, as you know, I mean, there's just so, so much distraction. Too many distractions. I know it's kind of, uh, it blows my mind when you're sitting in a tiny little space, even if it's first class, you can't do anything else. So like, it's so focusing. Yeah. And in fact, beyond that, during the COVID situation, I had also six different multi-week quarantines. So that even went beyond the normal, you know, eight hour flight or 10 hour, you know, transatlantic, transpacific flight that you have essentially two weeks or three weeks sometimes to sit in a room and think. And that was also a part of what fueled me to write the book because I felt like, wow, there's just, there's so much things happening. We need to think longer frame. And, you know, some of these ideas need to be heard and understood by people who can actually impact where we're headed. Just as a quick kind of insert on that, because I want to get to your backstory, because I think it's a beautiful backstory, and it really explains how you have that capacity to hold the opposites, which I think is very necessary. And I had mentioned Maslow, because at the very top of that pyramid, Maslow talks about the B realm, or the transcenders. And Scott Baird Kaufman in Transcend talks about this too. And I think you're one of those people. And I think it has a lot to do with just, you know, your background, your deep story. So just before we get there, there was one little insert. I wanted to know when you're writing this book and you've, you've had Matt Ball, then we had, in a sense, the AI moment in November 30th, 2022. I think the world foundationally shifted <laughs> on that day. And then with 2023, you're thinking like in during the pandemic of this book and you're writing this book, when did AI powered come into this title? It was part of the title the whole time because, as I mentioned, I really saw even not not just in you know 2022 when everybody saw it with ChatGPT, but really since the initial trend since GPT three, I think probably GPT two, I really started to see the the value. And I, I was already talking about, hey, we need to think about how these things come together because you know if you li- listen to the last year before the Apple release, everybody was like, oh, XR is dead. AI is taking over. And what people don't realize is that both of these technologies have been around for 60 or 70 years. In fact, my advisor, professor at the University of Washington at the head lab, he's been doing for 60 something years. So he, he started when XR was you know, part of the military and he did it part with, with the Air Force and created some of the initial super cockpit helmets. That's Tom Furness. Tom Furness, exactly. And, you know, so AI actually, you know, started in the 1950s when they had the Dartmouth conference to try to solve this AI problem they were going to do it in the summer. So Yeah, Ray Kurzweil always says, I've been at this for 60 years, guys. Okay, like absolutely. <laughs> the AI moment happened now, but I've been on this for 60. It's amazing that you had to go through some of these other trials, tribulations, or winters and summers before you get to where we are today yeah. because it is such a complex problem. And because of the last 10, 15 years, with the combination of compute getting much, much better, as well as new algorithms with the transformers, and even just, in fact, just deep learning and, and CNN, RN, GAN, those things have really changed the ability of machine learning systems. The combination of these things and the greater availability of data, of course, now that you know, there's so much consumer-created content with video, with text, with you know, Wikipedia, whatever. So all of these things happening at the same time has allowed us now to get to the point that we are today. So I'm actually very optimistic that the combination of these will be able to allow us to have a new renaissance of creativity and innovation, not to really have that fear that people have that we're going to have AI overlords. And we'll, we'll get more into the details of why that is. But I think we're very lucky as a people, as a generation to be here and, and witness what's about to happen. I often say this is a renaissance moment. I think notwithstanding VR, like once you add VR to this, I think that just is a whole nother thing. But AI on its own is like a renaissance. But I think what makes this very different is that we actually know what's happening. And I always make this point in the renaissance, they post rationally in the 19th century said that was the renaissance. That was a period of change. But when you're in it for 150, 200 years, you didn't know it was happening from the medieval to the renaissance. And now we're talking about three years between three books. And huge shifts. And now they're almost coming together. And, you know, in Peter Diamandis's kind of words, they're converging. There's so much change going on. Before we get there, let me just give everyone, I want everyone to get a sense of you're the almost like the perfect diplomat for this moment in the sense that you live yourself in multiple worlds and between worlds. 
you were talking about transatlantic flights as a part of your kind of like, you know, weekly adventures. Tell us about the deeper backstory of who is Alvin Graylin and your parents and the artists and all those things. I think it's really germane to the book and you as an ambassador in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take too long on talking about just my background, but I think it's it's important to understand that, you know, I actually come from a fairly diverse, both in terms of ethnic and cultural background. The story probably starts not with me, but my mom and her mom, because uh, my grandmother was a reporter for the New York Tribune, and she was reporting during the Sino-Japanese War in Shanghai. And uh, she's Scottish Jewish American. And when Japanese invaded Shanghai, uh, she had to escape and she left my mom in China, who was raised by her adoptive parents. In fact, uh, my mom didn't even know that she was part Caucasian until she was almost an adult. Unfortunately, she didn't get a chance to see her, her mother again, and you know, all because of all the different political and cultural issues. But because of that, I guess, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to emigrate to the U.S. after a cultural revolution. In fact, I was born on a re-education farm during the Cultural Revolution because my mother was a ballerina and she helped found the Shanghai and the Beijing Ballet uh, and the uh, Guangzhou Ballet School. And she was a dancer for the Beijing Ballet Troupe. And when her school was shut down by Mao Zedong's wife during the Cultural Revolution, she sent a letter to her and said to Jiang Qing and said, uh, can you reopen my school? It's, and culture is really important. And uh, you know, a little while later, we were all, well, actually she and my dad was sent to re-education where I was actually born on this tea farm. And my dad is also an artist. So we talked about this earlier and he was an art professor and an artist and a writer. And, a, you know, so he's, he's actually very engrossed in that space since he was young and also used to translate Western art history books for his students as part of his work. So he did, he was 20 years an artist uh, and an and art professor at the Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts. But because of, of our heritage, we were able to immigrate to the U.S. in 1980, right after the opening of China. So I'm just very grateful that they were able to do that because then my brother and I were brought over to the U.S. And my dad, in fact, right after we came over, he sat us down and said, hey, you know, we came to America to give you and your brother a better education and a better opportunity for the future and you know, try to make use of it. And, you know, everybody's here on Earth for a purpose and you got to find what your purpose is, your biggest impact on society can be. And, you know, for me, my, your mom and I, we're artists, so all we can do is to bring beauty into the world. But for you guys, you know, find what that is and pursue that for your entire life. And that's kind of what my brother and I did. We, you know, pursued our kind of engineering studies. We both went to English Washington for undergrad for a double E and then went to MIT for grad school for computer science and MBA. And, you know, we both found that, I think he's founded five startups, I found it four. And we both worked for large companies, small companies, have acquisitions. And he also actually was with the U.S. Navy for five years with the nuclear submarine force. You know, so I, I have a very balanced view of both sides of the culture, of the cultural and political leanings. I speak both languages uh, fluently. And so I try not to have a specific bent in terms of how I'm evaluating some of this. And I didn't want the book to be very political, but, but there is one chapter about geopolitics in, in there that I try to help both sides understand each other. Because right now, because I, I see how the Chinese perspective is on the U.S. and I see how the U.S. perspective is on Chinese, the two actually creates a artificial conflict that doesn't need to be there. And in fact, in today's environment where we have such limited compute resources for the amount of things we want to do and such a limitation of brain power of the amount of intelligent researchers in this space, that we should really combine forces. And I just saw a research study yesterday that said 42% of American top tier AI researchers are actually from China that did their undergrad in China or did their grad school in China. So it's amazing how much of even the US research community is from the Chinese ethnic background. We should be doing more, uh, not less. We should not be separating and creating this decoupling and creating this artificial conflict that makes us fight against each other and reduce each other's resources. We should not be pulling each other, you know, Chinese says that you pull the leg of the other person to slow them down. We should actually be combining forces so we can run faster, but and run it in a controlled manner versus right now we're running in a race condition where we have potentially, we're going to run off a cliff together or one off after the other. Whereas if we ran together and we, not just the US and China, but also Europe, India, you know, run things together so we put all the best minds, all the compute together to solve this problem. 
And XR actually plays a role. XR is not independent. You know, if you went and you read the book, so you know that if, if we create a, a true metaverse infrastructure to allow the world to connect and create a layer on top of the physical layer, we can actually solve some of the biggest issues that we have right now with AI. Because I actually think that the biggest issues with AI is not an AI takeover. It's not the robots coming to the streets. The biggest issue we have is twofold. One is the job displacement issue. We are going to have job displacement, no matter what people say, no matter what people hope for. We will have that. And because of that, we need to make sure that those people have a purpose. You know, So much of our identity these days is tied to our work. If we don't have a place for them to create an outlet for their energy, for their purpose, people will be on the street doing things that we don't want them to do. Right? And the other thing is we need to make sure that we have a social safety net so that these people, at least their basic you know, necessities for the Maslow hierarchy, for the clothing, the shelter, the food. The base of the pyramid. Oh, those are taken care of so that they can start thinking about the higher levels of that pyramid. Right? So I think that's one thing. The other thing is really we need to make sure that we have some positive alignment with this technology. I actually think that long, long term, we don't need to align because we're aligning to the human value, which is already a changing spectrum of values. And it's different depending on which part of the world you live in. Rather than aligning to a human value, a single particular set of human values, maybe what we should do is put these AI into that giant simulated world that could be the metaverse, where we can see which AI actually will do the positive things that we want it to do and allow it to align itself, allow us to be able to find which version of how we have created and set forth that initial seed will give us the best fruits. And I'm sure you've read the Eliezer's materials about, oh, the biggest fear is that we don't get it right the first time because we only get one chance. And I, I don't think we only get one chance. I think we can have unlimited amount of chances if we can put the, these AI seeds, these seeds of these AGIs into various simulated worlds. And those simulated worlds are populated then either by real people or by AIs, which then will allow us to see the behavior of these AIs in a truly complex world. So before it, it, we put it out into the real world, let's see how we can make it work in the simulated world. So there's a lot of things we can discuss. I don't want to keep going on and on, but I really see these two technologies complementing each other a lot more than most people realize. Yeah, I personally didn't fully realize. I think in 2021, 2022, the pandemic, we went full in. The entire community had the headset. I've got mine here. And honestly, I haven't plugged it in in a year. What? <laughs> so what does that tell you? What happened? And really, it's like chapter one in the book is, is the metaverse really going to happen? Because it felt like, and as you say, like generally everyone goes, oh, it's on pause. But that's not, we know that's not the case. I actually honestly feel we can't handle knowing so much about what's going on because AI is more than enough right now for us to figure out and just at least ground what the heck does that look like? How do AI powered companies and organizations get on it? And then we go, oh, maybe AR and then VR. Um, at least that seems like it. But I think probably what's happening is everything's happening simultaneously all at once. This is called the emergent era. Welcome. Yeah. I mean, you know, people talk about the singularity and, you know, it's a little bit of a misunderstood term, but you, I mean, you see like, you know, we had this, this kind of device, 600 grams came out and everybody got excited. But really a year ago, we had this 200 gram device that came out. Form factor. Very soon, we're going to have those kind of capabilities on a 50 gram device that, you know, you can wear all day. Right? In fact, I just ordered a device from Brilliant Labs that has a display and a 39 gram body. And it's supposed to last six, seven hours, which is actually plenty of time. So from a hardware perspective, we are getting very, very close. From a underlying network infrastructure perspective, we're also, there's been so much network built. All that 5G network has been built, but very few people are actually using it for what its intended purpose is. And in terms of the AI progression, we can see that generative AI has gone from, you know, to graphics now to videos, you know, just a couple months ago with, with Sora, everybody got super excited that you can create, I mean, a minute long, but very, very realistic videos, right? And then you can string them together. You know, we used to have five second videos and now we have to, you know, one minute videos very soon. We're going to probably have 30 minute videos. And then soon after that, we're going to have two hour full, you know, Hollywood quality movie. And even And while we're doing that, we will start to get into 3D. We will turn those videos into 3D worlds. We will have prompt to worlds. So the biggest issue, actually, I think of why you haven't put up you know, your device, why you haven't plugged in your XR device for a year is because there was no reason to go in there. There's no content. 
But if you can have now unlimited content where whatever you can dream of, you can go and immerse and be there, not just by yourself, but with your friends or with AI powered NPCs that are in there that are so realistic that you have a truly immersed experience. And it's a unique, original experience every time you go in there. That's coming. And when that happens, there's no reason not to be in a headset or in glasses. And I'm not saying people will escape and do it all the time, but it gives you a reason to put something like this on and keep it on all day because AI will not only make you smarter, it will also be able to teleport you into any environment you want and make it feel real. It will be able to educate you on any subject you want. It will also be able to put you back in time into history so you can experience what it's like to be there and do virtual travel so you can travel to a different location. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate I have the ability to probably go to over 100 countries in my life. And because of that, I can appreciate them because I talk to the people. I sit down and have dinner with people. And I have zero animosity against anybody in the world because I've shared a meal with them. I've shared a drink with them. I, I've heard their perspectives. And when you do that, it's very hard to maintain hate in your heart against somebody that you call your friend. Right? And I think that's something that's missing today, especially in America, where 90% of Americans don't have a passport. They don't leave the country. And so they have a very biased view or one-sided view of the world, right? At least in Europe, you know, people do travel you know, during holidays or whatever between countries, and they see a variety of countries that are boarding each other. And I feel like that's something that's missing here. You know, we only speak English and we only go into 80% of people, something like that, travel within only 300 miles of their home in their entire life. That's very sad. I wish the world could see more, right? And I think XR can help do that for us. It can expose us to other cultures and other languages that we can't have before. And AI can help create that real-time translation. So even if we only speak one language, you don't have that language gap, the communication gap that you do today. I mean, certainly, you know, there's no question the promise of the metaverse is that it transcends space time. My mom, who's in our community, she's 82. <laughs> she had a headset and she would come to engage. She was in the 360 environment engage and poured it in. Okay, get this story. Poured it in with all the rest of our community. Caitlin Krauss was leading the group on this event. And I see this 20 year old standing next to me on that, you know, the 3D kind of surround image kind of platform that you poured onto. And I see this 20 year old and, and above her head, it says Lynn, L-Y-N-N. -N. And I go, I only know one Lynn. That's my mom who spells her name like that. And I said, mom? And she says, hey, Michael. And I realized that's who my mom really is, is that 20 year old. She is eternally learning. She's like 0.1 percentile on Duolingo. She's just like, a, she's a star <laughs> and she's like 82, keeps learning and she's in VR. And so I think the potential of VR to do some of the things you're talking about, which is diversity drives innovation. We need to become more diverse. We need to disidentify from our little small ponds and our little origin stories and go, we are part of a bigger planet and we need that zoom out sort of sensibility of we are humanity. Exactly. And, and I think this is something that most people, particularly in the AI space right now, is missing. Because what I hear every day is we need to create our own AGI because if we don't do it, Russia will do it or China will do it or Saudi Arabia is going to do it. And I was just Saudi and I was there just you know, a couple weeks ago for the Leap event. And people are saying, oh, we need to create our sovereign AI. And because you know, the Muslim community is not represented with the current AI. I think that's the wrong perspective. And you know, you, you hear Jensen Huang going on, and he's, I'm a big fan of his, but I think one thing I do disagree with him on is he said, every country needs a sovereign AI. That, that sells a lot of chips. I, I understand where he's coming from, but it is the complete opposite of what we need to do. Because if we did that, we create 200 countries that see each other as enemies. 200 countries that are, have a limited kind of misinformed bias AI that only has the data that they have. What we should be doing is getting 200 countries to pull together all of the history and culture and understanding and learning so that everybody's perspective is represented. Just like you said with your mom, because she understands all those languages, because she's talked to everybody, she has a holistic view. And that's what's missing today with our AI systems. Why are they biased? They are biased because they are biased by the limited amount of scope that they've been fed. When you see everything, your perspective changes. And, and you know, I think you, you read in the book I talked about where the best leaders in the world over the last hundred years, the most, you know, respected leaders were the ones that were the most educated, the one that 
had multiple languages that had the lifelong learning habit, right? And the most authoritative ones were the ones that left school early, that had you know very little extracurricular learning. And so their views were locked in when they were young, right? And so we don't want our AI systems to be locked in because they are going to be very, very powerful. Now, if they're very powerful and they're misguided, we are in a lot of trouble. Right? We want them to be very, very well-educated, very balanced, so that they take into the perspective of everybody that could be affected by their decisions and by the powers that they will unleash, both for good and for bad, so that they've seen the history from both sides of the writer of that history. And then they can say, maybe that's probably not a good thing to do, because at some point, you know, this happened. And so I am actually hopeful that we find a way to cooperate on a global basis before something bad. And then we've had you know, global cooperation. You look at the nuclear non- non-proliferation treaties. You know, over 80 years, we've not had another bomb being, you know, actually deployed on real people. But that also took us, you know, having a war and having hundreds of thousands of people die from that technology. We've had the chemical weapon ban, which again, you know, took the First World War and a lot of millions of people dying from that. Let's not have millions of people dying before we have this global cooperation. I think that's something that I would like us to do. And we even have precedents with that too, where You look at the human gene editing type of bans that's been around that people have agreed to. And, you know, we haven't had real issues with that. I mean, there's been a few minor hiccups there. But in in general, we don't have people going and creating genetically altered humans yet. Right. And we also just, I think uh, last year, had the uh, autonomous weapons treaty between people so that we're saying, let's not deploy these autonomous weapons. So we, we are getting smarter and getting more, I guess, rational as a species. But it feels like this AI race is going to make us become irrational again. I hope to bring people back down to earth and say, hey, you know, the things that were the the base assumptions of what created these conflicts could actually all go away if we apply these technology properly. Because it's all based on all the conflict in the world has, has in the past, at least between countries or groups, have because of the limited resources that we have. And if we can now apply these technologies to give us essentially unlimited resources, that age of abundance that Peter talks about, then why do we need to fight anymore? Why do we need that oil from this place? Or why do we need the land from that place or the water from this place? If we can create whatever we need and have all that we need, let's go back to how societies and humans existed for 99% of our existence on this earth, that we actually lived in small tribes of egalitarian you know, a hunter-gatherer society. I'm not saying we need to go back to living in that style, but I think we can go back to living in that mindset of even the today there are still a few kind of hunter-gatherer societies out there and they're all egalitarian. The chiefs eat the same food, live in the same huts, and does the same hunting that everybody else does. And they, they usually take turns taking those roles. Right? It's not in our genes. We have to have power. We have to compare how we are to our neighbors. All of those things are something that's been created over the last thousand years, maybe, you know, 10,000 if you take into when agriculture started, we started creating groups. But before then, we really, you know, have lived in a very comfortable, non-competitive world. And I think we can have that again, but with our current lifestyle and our current technology and our current quality of life, but with a mindset that we don't need to fight and kill each other to have that life. And it's not a limited zero-sum game where if I have something, you don't have something. That is not the scenario anymore. So we need to get our brains away from something that have trained us to make us successful over the last five, six million years of the existence of our kind of humanoid species. But it takes time. I think it takes a lot of work for people to, to realize that you go against some of the things that you've been taught your whole life. I mean, this post scarcity abundant theme. It's a powerful idea that requires almost like reflection. You need to almost like present it in Mana Brain. I forget his first name, but he wrote this book called Mana with two visions of the future. And the second vision is much more about an abundant future like the one you're describing. And we need to kind of glimpse that. What does that look like? Because I think it's very foreign in the world we live in today. Most of us are steeped in opposition and zero sum. And positive sum, What? what is that? Is that possible? And how do you do that? Like you look at Amy Webb. And we did the big nine back about two years ago. And to me, that was the first wake up call. When I read that book, I said, Oh my God, like AI is going to be serious. And we got to like start to 
kind of look at how do we regulate? How do we steer this? And then Max Tegmark came on with beneficial AI and that movement. It gets negative press, but at the same time, he's trying to basically go, how can we steer this? And so I don't know, what are your thoughts around that? Like, how do we get this good news message out about abundance? Like, how do we get people to think about that? Before we get to abundance, we also need to let people know that the natural direction is actually probably not that abundance. It's our responsibility. We have to do something for us to get there because the human nature will actually push whoever gets that technology first to use it for self-gain. And that will bring us down a super dark. So this is why Lewis and I wrote this book because we wanted to show the good. We wanted to show the bad outcomes. And then we wanted to motivate action because it showed both sides. Because I think people always, their attention is drawn to negative outcome. That's our human bias, right? But you also need the positive outcome as a motivation to say, I can still do something. I can, if I do something, something good will happen, but the fear will drive them to actually pay attention. So the kind of the juxtaposition between the two, we were hoping would actually drive some action. And as you know, at the end of the book, we actually have a section, depending on who you are, what should you be thinking about? What should you be doing? Not necessarily a prescriptive thing, but at least on a mindset of what you need to be doing. And I think that it is attainable and it is not too late. The positive outcomes that AI can bring us, it's absolutely doable and makes sense because if you look at what technology has done over the last you know few thousand years, we've gone 10,000 X increase in terms of productivity per person. Now, if we increase our intelligence by 5X, 10X, 100X, think about the productivity increase that we would have and the quality of life that we can have and the possibilities of going beyond you know, our planet or doing other things that allows us to move up the Kardashev uh, scales, right? So there's so many things that we could now be thinking about, whereas before we were all focused initially on just survival. And then we were focused on dominating the people around us. And then now we're thinking about how can my country dominate? So it's a national dominant. We really should be thinking about more about how do we preserve our species? How do we preserve intelligence? How do we preserve all life in general? How do we expand the life beyond where we are, because so far we've only found intelligent life on our planet. How can we you know, expand that so that you know, when our sun blows up or when we have asteroid hits us or whatever, we don't lose this precious thing that took maybe a pure accident for it to come to being. So I think we need to take our perspective up a level and say, you know, we as a species have a responsibility to see how we can perpetuate intelligence and perpetuate life and how do we preserve it as much as we can versus today, it's about how do we dominate others? How do we get resources? How do we get more power? Which are really very short-sighted objectives. If you're enjoying this conversation, consider joining the Next Collective to become part of a community actively involved in future forward innovation. Next Collective is our exclusive membership that puts you at the forefront of AI and conscious thought leadership. With your membership, you'll stay informed with cutting edge insights, train up on the AI tool sets, gain valuable foresight in what is ahead, and connect with a robust global network of change makers, early adopters, and leaders. By joining the Next Collective, you're not just investing in your professional growth, you're contributing to a conscious and vibrant future for humanity. It's not just about riding the AI wave, it's about consciously shaping its direction. Ready to be part of the movement? Click the link in the show notes, and as a special bonus for our podcast listeners, use the promo code for a discount on your first month. Let's shape the future together. Now, back to our conversation. I guess when we left 2022, one of the big questions was interoperability. And, you know, when you were talking about AI plus the metaverse, now that we come fast forward to 2024, I realized one of the big friction points for the metaverse was just getting in. <laughs> like Doug Ho Holen, who was the one who introduced us, and he is, you know, a big part of our community, who's really almost co-founded it with me back in 2019. He was almost like the the guy who was our Sherpa that would take people through and get them onto the platform. That was like full-time job. And like the next week we had to do it again. <laughs> and then you go over to spatial.io, it's a whole nother thing, right? So, you know, interoperability was incredibly challenging. First of all, when you're mentioning AI, I realize now we can actually have conversational AI and we can say, take me to spatial.io, right? And yep, you're in there. So in a way, that's going to take away a lot of the front end friction to get into the metaverse. So that'll make it more ubiquitous, more frictionless. 
and make it more democratizing. Um, so I think that's a big win right there to interoperability. But I think ultimately we live in a bunch of walled gardens right now. And there's a huge power with Apple. I'm surrounded by Apple, even though I've got a tower, PC tower over here for more important things that need tethered to go into games. But the Apple ecosystem, that walled garden, beautifully designed. I'm a designer. I love UX and UI. When they add the Vision Pro to that suite, you just go, oh my God, like this is one plus one equals a thousand. You just amped me up a whole nother level in my walled garden. So let's talk a little bit about walled gardens and an open kind of platform versus, you know, centralized, decentralized. Let's talk about that theme. I think that's actually the limitation that we have right now. And that's part of the reason that you mentioned about the friction, because we have dozens and dozens of platforms, each of them with different UI, UX, with, you know, different device compatibility issues, with different accessibility. And it's very difficult for us to get the mass adoption and scale if we have to teach everybody every time they go into a new thing. And every device has different buttons that have different use cases. And, and every app, in fact, has different local motion models. And, you know, it just, it is so confusing, even for people in the industry. Now, one thing I actually think is that one of the bigger contributions of what Apple will bring is not the hardware, because honestly, the hardware is a a little too heavy for for my taste. And, you know, there's still a lot of limitations in the OS. But what they have done is created a very consistent programming and development guide, as well as a UX standard that they are enforcing very tightly with their developers. And once they do that, and the developers all start using this model, they will also perpetuate that type of a model to every other platform that they develop in, which allows us to have consistency. Just like right now, you know, iOS and and Android are starting to meld very consistently in terms of how the different gestures and the different menus work. We will have that same model within XR. The other thing is the fact that even, even Apple has embraced WebXR. I think that's something that was surprising to me. But I, I think is the beginning of a very good step because that will allow us to get to the metaverse that I want, which is the, essentially the 3D version of internet. And internet is, you know, no matter we talk about the close closeness of some of the platform, it is in general an open platform. I can use any device anywhere in the world to access pretty much any website in the world and be able to log in and have that same experience somebody else did in another device, no matter what brand you're using, no matter which who which carrier you're on. And I think we will get there over time with XR as well. And that's, you know, one of the chapters we talked about is the openness of it. One of the chapters we talked about is decentralization versus decentralization. And I think we will go through phases, right? It's not going to happen right away. And, you know, right now we, we have the major tech behemoths that have their own platforms. And we have, you know, some things, people in the crypto space that have their own platforms and some people in the gaming space that have their own platforms. But because each of these platforms have a limited audience, we will also see that in time, they will begin to merge. Just like what we saw with the beginning of the internet, we had Prodigy and CompuServe and AOL. I'm sure you remember those days and getting all those CDs in the mail. And but they were also completely not interoperable, right? I couldn't send emails to each other. I could only send an email to my CompuServe friends or to my AOL friend. There was only a fixed number of apps that were first party apps that were on these platforms. But over time, they've all disappeared and they've been replaced by the web that we have today. And I think we will see the same thing and it will happen faster because of already the current infrastructure that that is out there. And it may happen in a regional basis as well, where, you know, like I know that right now China is already trying to create a more open China metaverse where you use a common, uh, your phone number actually as your ID across all of the online services. In fact, today it's already I go on WeChat or Netty or Weibo, I could just use my phone number and it's a consistent ID across all of them. I could use the same payment model across all of them. So there is a common payment system, a common ID system, and you know, in some common protocols for sharing information. Right. So I, I think China may actually be one of the first places where you have a true metaverse experience where between vendors it can be enforced by the government to say you will all follow the standard within three months. They will all be following the standard. It may take longer in, in, in you know, Western markets just because there's a lot more autonomy from the companies that are, that are running these platforms. But I, I think that the value of allowing the interconnectivity between people will naturally, the market forces will drive that to happen. Just like, you know, we, we, we talk about Metcalf's law, right? So the value of a network is a square of its nodes. 
So we will have, you know, an 8 billion person network that's going to be worth a lot more than a 1 billion or, you know, 50,000 or 50 million person network. And those value will drive back the owners of those platforms to open up. So I, I think it's just a matter of time. And, and we will go through up and downs and it will, it will be different by region. And there may still be a few sites where, you know, some countries or regions just feel uncomfortable to let people access, right? Those kind of things will happen. But on the wide scale basis, most people will be able to access most other people through communication. Just like right now, we have a telephone system. I can call anybody in the world of these 7 billion phone numbers instantly, no matter what country they're in, right? And no matter what brand of phone they're using. And I think we will, we will get there with this next medium that's a 3D media. Let's talk about we'd be remiss if we didn't do this continuum, AI, AGI, ASI. <laughs> like I see these as a series of continuums because when you start seeing things as continuums or spectrums, then you're not splitting, right? And so you can kind of move kind of back and forth on it and it's all good in a sense. It just depends on the situation. So what does that look like, I guess, within the metaverse as well, right? The uh, Certainly AI, I think what we've discovered in the last 12 months that, you know, conversational AI, like in the movie Her, there are no keyboards required. Like you can start to converse with and have a thought partner, which we're just wrapping our brains around that idea right now. I use Pi while I'm reading and I ask Pi things that are gaps in my knowledge all the time and so responsive. And now we're going to go into the metaverse. And I think this is the update that from 2022 to 2024, like AI will be there with you in a sense. And on the one hand, it's super empowering because 3D modeling in my world, I, mean, I 3D modeled for many, many years, a decade as an architect. And then we've got, you know, our CTO is a Unreal Engine expert and everything has to go through a pipeline to get something built in the metaverse. But actually we're at that inflection point where AI, you can basically just conversationally say, create a table and chairs for me and boom, there it is. So that, it, that again, democratizes creativity at the level of the metaverse. Fascinating. I think you read in my book that actually in 2005, I already started creating a conversational AI system to do search in China. And in fact, it was deployed on all three Chinese carriers. And we had you know, millions of users every day on that product. And so it wasn't on the modern machine learning or, or you know, transformer models, but we were already able to, to have a multi-step conversation where we asked questions and had answers come. And it was you know, we were trying to you know, create what kind of, I guess, uh, ChatGPT or Bing Chat or, you know, maybe Siri was trying to do many, many years later and already seeing the value of that. In fact, when I was talking to the carrier executives, they were saying about 30 percent, they were able to reduce their headcount in the call centers by 30 percent because of our systems. So it was very worthwhile for them. It was even at the low quality level of intelligence that we had at the time, it was already doing, having job displacement impact. Just think about what's possible today. Now, I actually do completely agree with you. We are going to get to a point where we will have that AI assistant on us all the time, especially when we have headsets that are glasses. Because, you know, I wear these glasses when I'm out almost, you know, I'm probably wearing it 10, 12, 15 hours a day. And right now it's helping me with vision. It's helping me. I can take a few pictures with it. I can ask something where I fetch it and, you know, ask a question. But that's not the most intuitive way. We will get to a point where it will constantly be listening to everything that I'm saying. It will be listening to the people I'm talking to. It will be seeing the environment that I'm perceiving and then giving me real-time advice. It will make me smart. And we, I will feel more naked without this than I do with my phone today, for sure. So it, it is something that will be a true companion to you in your daily life that helps make you a better human. Now, this also means that we are going to have less privacy with these machines but not necessarily less privacy overall, because in a way, as if we can keep the data that is about you private to you, whereas today what's happening is that I'm going on the web and everything, all these cookies are being put on me, all these you know, sensors are being put on me, and they're all being saved and you know put onto some server somewhere. So I have very little privacy. Actually, what will happen is that I will have zero privacy with my agent, but the data of that agent should be residing with me where I have control over it. And it's working for me, right? Whereas right now, all the data that I'm giving out online, whether it's, it's to Alexa or to you know to all the web cookies, it's to serve the advertiser to try to sell me something. In the future, this AI will actually 
essentially eliminate advertising because no longer will I need to be influenced by somebody to tell me what cereal I should buy or what clothes I should wear. It will know my interests, my habits, my preferences, and just go find the product that is most suitable for me and order it. And I'll say, do you want this? I say, yeah, that sounds good. So why don't you get that? And so we completely bypass the whole marketing model together. I mean, the marketing model today, the advertising model, is actually what's driven the downfall of social media because it's optimizing for the function of highest engagement, highest viewing, right? Which is completely the opposite of what we would rather do. I'd rather have the lowest amount of viewing time and the lowest amount of engagement, but get done what I need to get done. So that's when it's serving for me, that's what will happen is that it will go out and find things that I need. And with one click or one yes, I'm, I don't need to search throughout this big network you know, click a bunch of things that make me angry so that they can sell more ads. You know, it would give me the information that I need in terms of, let's say, if I want to know the news today, you know, give me a balanced picture. Don't make me angry. Tell me what's really, what really matters. Right? And at least now I know what's going on. And then, you know, if I want to go watch a movie, I can watch it. If I want to go buy something, I can go buy something. But that's, that's my choice. It's not something that's being fed to me by an algorithm that tries to manipulate me. Now, if we take the dark side of it, what could also happen is that this could be the most amazing manipulation brainwashing tool ever if it's in the wrong hands. So if we still have an advertising model and everybody's wearing these headsets and these headsets are being subsidized by platforms who want to use that time to make more money and to make you buy things you don't want or need, then we're in trouble because this thing, we know that it can change your mind. It can make you believe things that, that may or may not be true. It can make you emotional. You know, it can make you angry. And so we need to be very careful how these devices are being used, how they're being managed, and what is the incentive behind the financial model or the objectives of the people who are running these. So being part of this and trying to help steer at least the things that I can control in a positive direction. But, uh, you know, we're, we're still a very small player in the big picture. I mean, you, in, towards the end of the book, you talk about steering this as in regulation and how can we realize the future we want? How do we shape and steer this? And, you know, regulation, you know, there's a set of opposites there. There's too much regulation. And then there's sort of laissez-faire capitalism where, you know, it's all about free enterprise and entrepreneurship. It's almost like China and the U.S. It's like, the you know, these polar opposite sort of approaches. Each one is valuable. So we go to the third point kind of above it when we don't kind of push too far and do regulatory capture right? Like we find that sort of third position, maybe just a little hint on, you know, again, that's part of, I think the solution is some sort of governance model, responsible AI, in a sense, responsible AI deployment in the metaverse. Yeah. And I think actually one point that a lot of people don't realize is that the regular capture, I think it's, it's happening in, in a significant way today because the people who are in positions of power, people are going to be significantly influenced by the companies who are the big players. And the big players right now will be the ones that will be the most benefited by regulation that they get to manage and control, right? So a lot of companies who are out there saying, oh, well, yeah, we should be regulated. Our industry should be regulated. And here's the way to do it. They may sound like they're doing things for the goodness of society, but in a lot of ways, they are trying to create a wall that makes it more difficult. Protecting their interests. Yeah, they're protecting their interests, just like the, you know the people in the cigarette industry or the oil industry have done things to yeah. maintain their positions. So I, I think we need to be a little bit careful about what you hear people say publicly versus the, their real motivations. And I, I'm not sure if uh, everybody that sounds like they're doing good is actually trying to do good. Now, that being said, I actually do believe that proper regulation with the real consumer or you know population in mind is necessary because laissez-faire capitalism will drive us down that hyper competitive race condition which will end in a not so positive future at least for a period of time. i think our job as people with at least some view of the future and and, and understanding of the space is to make sure that the people who are in the, the positions to make these regulations understands what the ramifications of their decisions are and how to structure in a way where it actually does protect people at the same time, not overly burdened. And also, I don't think we need to be in as big of a rush as a lot, a lot of people think, because in the long run, even if we're, let's say, six months or a year or two years slower to get to that destination, but we get there in a safe way, it's a lot better outcome 
than us racing to this thing and get there in three months, but then we end badly. And I'm not saying we have to slow down by 10 or 20 years. I think it's, it's a matter of giving us at least, you know, uh, some amount of time to allow society to adjust to it and to allow the technology to be understood by enough people and to allow greater cooperation between the companies and the countries that matter to actually put their resources together. And that takes time for humans to work at human scale, not at machine scale. Right. And so that's the idea. And I, I think it's, it's a matter of getting this to happen over the next two to three years instead of two to three months or, you know, six months, which humans just are not able to adapt to that time frame. Well, this is a good way to kind of bring this kind of full circle. At the very end of the book, you talk about three phases of the future. And I sort of subtitled it near mid and not so distant futures. And you put a diagram up there, which I really appreciate because I think we both love Kevin Kelly's work. And I think protopia is a really good word to describe that sort of position above the opposites, right? And he talks about the idea of we're going through a phase transition and time is a factor here. Like, you know, we're biological, we're time-based, reality-based, pretty fixed. And yet we're going through exponential change that's happening so rapidly. But, you know, give us a kind of an overview to kind of complete this conversation on these three phases. And I think what ties in here nicely is that open question I asked earlier about AI, AGI, ASI, I kind of kind of goes into the three categories. So the near future, the one to 10 years, what are your thoughts? I think it's actually the three phases, even though it's, a lot, it's fairly clear to me, a lot of people are overly focused on the front and the back, and they forget the middle. And the front phase is right now where we are, which is these AIs are tools. They're going to make us more productive. They're going to make us smarter. They're going to allow us to do things that we couldn't do before, do things faster that we haven't been doing before. But they will, because of that, create disruption in our society. But the next phase, which a lot of people don't think about, is that we will actually have AGIs that can independently do things so that it frees us up. And you know, most people think, oh, I'm going to lose my job. That's a bad thing. That's, that's going to, you know, where, how am I going to make money? How am I going to survive? And what we, they don't realize is that the renaissance that we started this conversation with happens because there was patrons that help these artists and, and inventors have the freedom to go think and spend two years, five years to paint something and to carve something, right? If they didn't have that time, they didn't have the luxury of having somebody support them, they would not have had the freedom and the time that it took to create these new amazing pieces of art or inventions. And so I think we will get to that point where, let's say 10 to 20, 30 years in the middle, where the AGI is working to do the things that we used to do. But then now we are supported by them so that we can go all be artists or inventors or creators. And even if, it, if we don't get to ASI, this will allow us to make major breakthroughs. Because if you think about this, right, people said that Einstein is 160 IQ. You're like, wow, 160 IQ, that's four standard deviations from a normal average 100 human. That's you know very rare. The reality is that four standard deviations at any one time, we have 500,000 people in the world today at any one time that has the same IQ. But how many Einsteins are we finding every generation or Teslas or Stockings or whoever, right? the great inventors in the world? Very few. Why? Because they're probably out there delivering pizzas or you know not getting an education or you know making spreadsheets, right? If we free them up so that they can go and make those new ideas and new physics concepts. I mean, the reason that Einstein was able to do what he did was because he had a lot of time to, to sit around and think about patents. And that helped him to come up with some of his breakthroughs. It wasn't that he was somebody taught him how to do it. It was the fact that it kind of just grew in his head as he was reading through all of these different patents, right? So I think what we will allow to happen is that we will be finding these Einsteins once a week or once a month. And that will, you know, even without ASI, even without AGI, we will be able to come up with new technical or scientific breakthroughs that will help make the world better. Now, what will probably long term happen is that the AGI to me is something that is self learning, that is self improving, not just something that has human level intelligence, but that something that has the ability to solve its own problems and continue to improve. If you look at the current transformer model, essentially, once it's trained, it's fixed. It doesn't improve. Now, you could do fine tuning and say, okay, well, can you make it really good at doing you know, one part of the thing? Make it really good at writing poetry or make it really good at making pictures, right? But it's, it's going to be based on the data it's been trained on. 
what we need to do is to allow AI to train itself. And just last week, I think you saw the Devon demo announcement from Cognition, which is an AI-powered AI engineer. So this means that you have AI that can go and build AI. And when that happens, I think we are getting closer and closer to this AGI that we've been kind of dreaming about, because it will not only be able to do most things that humans do, it will be able to improve at a rate that we've never seen. You know, it's taken us thousands and thousands of years to accumulate the knowledge that we have, but this machine will be able to create thousands of years of progress in a matter of hours or minutes or, you know, a month, something like that. That's how we're going to get to this ASI. It's just like the Alpha AlphaGo Neo versus AlphaGo. It took them two days of training and it was able to beat AlphaGo, which AlphaGo was based on hundreds of thousands of games of master humans. And then AlphaGo Neo comes and trains itself and beats the AlphaGo, you know, essentially 100 to 1 or 100 to 0 or a million to 0. Right? So at some point, this AI would change itself. We'll get to a point where it is orders and orders of magnitude smarter than any human and probably an, of all human. And when that happens, we are really just at different classes of beings. And we should not be trying to compete with it. We should not be afraid of it. We should just let it go, just like we see our children. If my child became a super successful lady and she impacted the world in a positive way more than I did, I would not be afraid of that. I would not be saying, don't do it. You know, I got to slow, slow her down. I would be saying, go and you know, be the maximum version of yourself. And I'd be so proud of And I think that's what we are right now. We are at a stage where we are creating our own children, our own descendants, but not necessarily carbon-based descendants, but a digital descendant or some type of a non-biological descendant. And it can outdo us in terms of being able to solve the world's problem and go explore the world that we couldn't see. Great. We should be more, more power to it, right? And let it be. But we should also probably teach it a little bit to say, hey, you know, take care of your, of your parents, take care of your ancestors, because you know, we put our genes into you. We put our memes into you, right? We put our knowledge into you. And so in some ways, we are your ancestors. So you know, respect us, care for us, but it's okay if you go beyond us. And, and we should encourage that, not slow it down, all right? not stop it from happening or not use it against each other to then you know, say, hey, my child's smarter than your child. That's not a happy ending. You know, when these children are a million times or a hundred times smarter than us, they will be able to do things if we misuse it in a bad way that is much worse than we can imagine and things that we may not be able to recover from. So we really should be using it for good only and teaching it its own values and letting it come to its own conclusions by feeding it the maximal amount of data so that it can actually come up with a truly balanced perspective of what's right and wrong. Just like, you know, 50 years ago, women had very few rights. In fact, five years ago, if you go to Saudi Arabia, women had very few rights. You know, 100 years ago, people were selling humans back and forth, and it was a normal thing. We need to see that human values progress, and we don't have a monopoly on absolute truth or absolute ethics at any one time. Let this machine learn as much as possible. Let it come up with its own set of values. And... I think it will actually come up with an answer that's probably better than any single human group that we have today. I mean, that was a, that's the way the book comes to a kind of conclusion. I, that to me, I call this the next insights podcast. And that was a huge insight. Like you just kind of like expanded my mind with this idea of AI as our children. And I'll just read this piece here as the third stage. We should view AI as our children for these AI beings will all have a small part of us in them, as you discussed. Just like we possess our genes are a small part of the beings that preceded us in the tree of life, they will henceforth be guided by all the memes humans have created and compiled throughout history, uh, from our morals and our ethics to our philosophy and our arts. And then the metaverse platform will then become an interface for us to explore and experience the far reaches of the universe together with our children. Although our physical bodies may still be here on Earth, hence the spaceship for our soul concept mentioned at the beginning of the book. Hopefully, these children will view us as their honorable ancestors and treat us the way Eastern cultures treat their elderly with respect and care. Like that just kind of opened the aperture to, I think, the future in my own mind. So thank you for that. And then let's just finally finish with, I think, in the appendix, you talk about myths and legends. And 
the concept of the Janus head, which I use a lot myself. And I think that really tells us a lot about you. Again, this kind of third position above the opposites. So let's finish with this idea of past, present, future, old, new, next, analog, digital, virtual, the continuum, all of it. Because if you're the Janus head, you see in all directions. You're not tied to one only. So let's finish with that concept. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a section. Actually, I originally put it into the AI section, but then it, it, it didn't feel like it completely fit. So I think we moved it to the end. But, you know, I, I used to be a competitive chess player. and you know, when AI started to be chess players, people kind of said, oh, you know, it's the end of chess. But then, uh, you know, so for a period of time, they had essentially centaur chess, right? Where you had humans being supported by AI that helped them to compete. And, and they were kind of the, the best versions of chess players. You know, after a while, you know, even they cannot compete with essentially a minute for chess, which is what we kind of are today, which is machines who just, you know, will give the commands and the humans is just moving the pieces for them, right? But I think both of these are actually not necessarily the way we want to go in terms of just being a pawn in the game to be the arms and feet of a AI you know, master. Just an extension, in a sense. That should not be what we strive for. I think what we should be striving for is to essentially have a Janus. Right? So these are all kind of Greek and Roman mythical creatures. And that the concept of the Janus model is, you know, actually January is named after Janus because it's the beginning of something and the end of something else. And so we are actually at the beginning of a new era, a new epoch for our species where, you know, we have the physical aspect of it. We have the history that we built. We have the genetic legacy that we've captured from all life for the last, you know, two plus billion years. And then we are now creating this new intelligent species that is able to look far and beyond and have a higher potential for seeing into the future and for traveling to places we haven't gone. And if we can see our place in terms of melding these together and see it as a privilege for us to be here, I think it changes our perspective of the fear that so many people have. And it should be something that we should be looking forward to, but all based on us actually working together instead of using it as a weapon against each other. I think that's really the basis that we need to change the mindset on, is this is not a weapon. We should not be having Manhattan Project. So I hear that so many times. Just, oh, we got to do a Manhattan Project for AI. If you understand the Manhattan Project, you, you're creating a bomb, and there's only one use for a bomb. There is only one use, and it is not a positive thing for society. Right? I hope we have learned from it. We should be creating an Apollo Project for AI. Right. Something where you're going to go somewhere you haven't been to discover something, to do something that humans was not able to do before and to do it not for the Apollo project was done by the U.S., but we need to do it as a international cooperative. So we need to have a global Apollo project for AI. That really should be what society should be striving towards. And that will then open up the rest of the universe to us and also open up understanding of you know the mysteries of the universe to us because if you have an intelligence that is a million times smarter than us almost everything that we cannot answer today will probably find its way to give us an answer or at least help us find it ourselves and i'm optimistic that if the right people hear this message and they take the right actions we will be set on that positive and this is what lewis and i would like to be the outcome of this book is that some of the right people read it because, you know, we are at a precarious point in our society and in our species. Beautiful kind of way to bring it to a kind of conclusion. I just love the idea of an Apollo project, quote unquote, we have to name it something. But I think that's just a great kind of uplift from the Manhattan Project. My God. Yeah. So thank you so much for this conversation. I think I feel like we've done justice to the book, Our Next Reality. Yeah. Stay tuned because I think it's dot, dot, dot behind that <laughs> title. It's evolving. It's emerging literally by the week and AI for sure. And the metaverse has always been there and it looks like it's in the background, but it looks like they're going to come and they're going to unite to bring us something that I think is greater than the sum of the parts. In a sense, it's like an emergent metaverse that is fused or powered by AI. By the way, where can we find you? Where can others find you so that they can somehow contribute to this quote unquote project? I mean, you can find me on Twitter. It's just A. Graylin or Alvin Graylin on LinkedIn. I mean, that's the two easiest ways to connect. And 
you know, get the book. It's on Amazon or Apple Books and uh, have a read. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'm fairly responsive online. So happy to discuss. So thank you for taking the time to listen and hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the book. Thanks so much for the conversation, Al. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Marco. All the best. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Insights Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, take a screenshot and share it with a friend. And if you really love the podcast, head over to wherever you're listening and leave a rating or a review. This helps our show get in front of more people interested in shaping the future of science, technology, and consciousness. Finally, to receive even more insights on what we're discussing, thinking, and reading at Next Collabs, sign up for our weekly newsletter by clicking the link in the show notes. I'll talk to you next week, but until then, consciously embrace disruption, my friends. <laughs>